broadcasting live from the guest chair on Riley Poole's podcast, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Garrett Strother. And I'm your other host, Seamus Connolly. And this week we... Boy, oh boy, I'm sure we're going to have more than a ton to say in our main segment today, which we are covering the entire first season of the Disney Plus original series, National Treasure, Edge of History. Oh, God, it's, it weighs heavy on me to even say those words, but my goodness, here we are. You know, not as bad as I expected it to be. We'll get into it. But first, we do have some news, lots of weird things going on. First off, the very sad news that legendary songwriter Burt Bacharach has passed away, probably most known for Raindrop Keep Falling on My Head from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, or as Seamus knows it from Spider-Man 2. <laughs> I mean, I would have remembered that it was in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid if I got to think about it longer, but that's maybe truly one of the only songs I know of his. Six Grammys, three Academy Awards a absolute legend of 60s and 70s pop culture, so much so that he, I think the first way that I was exposed to Burt Backrack, and probably you were the same, is his cameos in all three Austin Powers movies. <laughs> yes, that is probably one of the only actual things that I will remember him forever from. As a kid, obviously, right over my head, but I mean, it is genuinely very funny when you look back at it now. I love his collaborations with Elvis Costello, which I guess Elvis Costello does appear in Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me alongside <laughs> Backrack. He? Yeah, he does. No kidding. It's been a while. I, I know you, I, you've you got that Blu-ray box up there. I, it has been since the VHS days for me. He left an indelible mark on pop culture, both in music and film, and he will be missed. But up next on our news today, a move that I know that we don't personally agree with at all, AMC is now charging more money for better seats in theaters. I am glad I'm I'm getting those extra free movies now with A-List, I guess. I, I feel like I am going to just pick the worst seats all the time now. So... They're having three tiers. There's value sightline, standard sightline, and premium sightline available at AMC's after 4 p.m. So showings before 4 p.m. apparently will not have these restrictions placed on them. There's not a precise timeline on when they're going to roll this out nationwide. I know it's already in select markets. Seamus, do you think much like Netflix's recent password crackdown, sharing crackdown, and then immediate rescinding of that policy, do you think that... We're going to be able to bully AMC out of this one. I think that's the dream, really, bullying a a corporate. They're the the largest name in theaters that I can think of, and I would hate for this to to come to fruition here. I know, like, assigned seating in general, when that started to roll out more in larger theater chains, there was still, like, holdouts in so many places around the country that, like, it took till even more like a couple of years ago from now that they implemented it. So if this somehow does come through, I would just love for the longest I can avoid it as possible because this just seems ridiculous. Especially with the movies being back in such a big way, Spider-Man No Way Home, Top Gun Maverick, Avatar The Way of Water, all had packed opening weekends in the last year and a half. I'm shocked that finally movies are go are coming back. People are going back to the cinema and they're like, how can we mess this up even worse than we already have? I mean, uh, theaters, theater chains, I feel like are already hanging on by a thread, even with all of the insanity that streaming services are now getting into that we have to consistently cover right now. But to mix it up like this and to it, it feels like they're getting too big for their britches because movies are really bad like i've had some great theater experiences in the last year like you said uh, off the back of like the covid restrictions and the shutdowns and all that so i feel like they're kind of jumping the gun here i i feel like a good amount of people aren't even comfortable going to the theaters at all still and and they're they're already trying to capitalize on people liking doing that kind of thing already i think it's going to backfire hardcore 
I I am afraid that it's possible we might have to institute an AMC attack button on the wall <laughs> oh, next to God. our warning warnings and Paramount panics. Is that just a deep fry version of the heartbreak feels good in a place <laughs> like this music? Are we just messing that up? Speaking of movie mega corporations being frustrating, on the recent Disney quarter one earnings call, Disney CEO Bob Iger announced that, you know, Frozen 3, Zootopia 2, and Toy Story 5 are on the way, and also Disney is laying off 7,000 employees. Well, for, well, first of all, I feel like who even wants Frozen 3, Zootopia 2, Toy Story 5? I feel like those are far from anything that would distract people enough from 7,000 layoffs. Like, that is, that, that's crazy to me. That's the thing. Normally, I feel like you and I would be discussing the merit of those individual sequels, which we all, which I'm sure we have opinions on all three of those potential ideas. But, and this could be potentially more fallout from the 20th century fox merger but the fact that disney is making more money per year than any company in history ever and is still laying off thousands of employees at a time is disheartening and frankly evil yeah evil is probably the best way to put that right now and i mean again it's like evil for the sake of a bottom line where they know they can can seven thousand people at once and still skyrocket all the box office money with three sequels that are probably i mean i didn't love toy story 4 i didn't love frozen 2 i guess i didn't see zootopia but i know that they're just churning stuff out while cutting corners it's just gonna be more soulless disney stuff for them to just pack the theaters with i guess don't go see toy story 5 i know you're our man in the toy box out here you know you you are you are a resident Woody and Buzz expert. I, w- I would like to know, are you going to see another Toy Story sequel? I mean, we're playing into their hands by even talking about it. <laughs> I, I, I guess, but uh, is but this the stand you take, or is that more I like I didn't a, see wow, Lightyear, whatever. to be fair. I hated Toy Story 4. I don't know. When a trailer comes out, that's when we'll actually talk about this, I think. As close as Toy Story is to my heart, there's something that's close to both of our hearts, Seamus, and that is... The Fast and the Furious Family. Boy, howdy. This Fast X trailer was a whirlwind. Uh, we both had a little sit down together, cracked a couple Coronas as as one is wont to do. And we watched this new trailer. And man, am I are we excited for what Fast X is, is going to turn out to be? Lots of stuff going on. Rita Moreno is Dom's mom. Brie Larson's here. Who knows what she's up to? Charlize Theron Cypher is back. And of course, Jason Momoa, the main villain of Fast X, is going to be the guy who they were stealing from in Fast Five, which is a really deep callback at this (laughs) point. It really is. Oh, how are they going to explain however many movies worth of years that this guy's just been brewing his revenge? I don't know. Well, your theory that we discussed when we watched the trailer of Jason Momoa having the Bizarro family, the anti-family. Oh, yeah. Maybe he's been building them up. Because I think clearly part of it is the fact that they're trying to go back to, one, not only a time when Brian was in these movies to tie it back a little bit more to the core of the franchise, but also remind everybody, you know, you remember how good Fast Five is, guys? You know, <laughs> Oh, like, my God. The they're going to go back to the safe chase, and it's just going to be like, I guess this is rehashing it, but man, is it fun to watch again. I I'm mean, come on. so excited about the opening 15 minutes of this movie being the safe chase from Jason Momoa's oh, perspective. Hell yeah. Because imagine the horror movie of not being Dom and Brian, but there's a safe just crashing through highways and buildings in downtown Rio. Oh, it's so fun when you're in the perspective of the good guys of that chase because you're just like in awe of how crazy everything is. But now you definitely seeing it from his perspective, Jason Momoa's perspective, it's it's gonna be like heartbreak. Are we gonna like turn on the family, maybe? Are we gonna are we gonna <sighs> if they could love if they could get me to turn on Vin <laughs> Oh, I don't that know. Would be cinema, truly. Another thing I want to just throw out there is that we have a potential face off scenario with Letty and Cypher that they show flashes of. 
I, I want to, reflecting on this trailer again since we watched it the other day, it does look a good amount like Idris Elba's Cyborg <sighs> Lab. And I don't You're know if they're right. going to... I don't know if they're going to maybe cross that in to be like a bridge of like weird bio medical science stuff, but we have to get there. It's very still unclear. Well, we know Shaw is back, which he wasn't in nine and him and Han, I guess Man. he technically was in nine because he was in that sick post credit scene in nine. true, which is, I guess, clearly setting up their portion of this movie where it seems like it's going to be a lot of them driving together. Han and Shaw. Han and Shaw, The Rock, nowhere to be seen. Very, Not surprising. Uh, no, yeah, exactly. Unsurprising, but kind of surprising. There seems to be, like, races in this movie, which is, I don't know if they're going to do a lot of flashbacks to when the racing was more of the focus, but it looks like they're racing again. I'm, I'm shocked. He's racing Jason Momoa. He's racing. Yes, in, like, a street, like, a Race Wars-style street race. It's It's incredible bananas bonker stuff going on in this john cena has bazookas strapped to oh, the side yes. of his car dom is driving his car out the back of a plane onto a highway then pulling down helicopters <laughs> with it god uh, they like nuke rome they're in rome <laughs> and they like blow it up like it's the kremlin in mission impossible or whatever they, they're going big they're not they're not stepping out looks like a lot of people are getting arrested and all that too so it's probably gonna break up the family in that kind of way it's getting pretty loud it's getting pretty rowdy and the fast and furious saga is not going to go gentle into that good night shavis it's gonna go out with a bang I oh do absolutely that. absolutely i'm ready to I'm ready to just, like, have uh, maybe just a panic attack from high heart rate watching Fast X in the theater. I'm, 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 I'm ready to track down some The Rock-branded ZOA energy drinks and just <laughs> jack ourselves up and, I and go crazy. I want Fast and the Furious-branded energy drinks. Slap uh, Dom's face on it. I'll drink two of them and, like, I'd, die, I guess? We, I don't know. <laughs> we would drink them. That's the embarrassing <laughs> it part. It really would. Dude, we both had the independent idea of getting Coronas to watch a trailer the other day, so we're we're stuck in it. But let's go ahead and move on to our main segment, National Treasure, Edge of History. Ah, let's do it. For today's main segment, we are covering the entire first season of the Disney Plus original series, National Treasure, Edge of History. Garrett, we watched this separately from each other, and I think that might influence how we both saw this, but I would love to know your overall thoughts on this entire first season of National Treasure. What did you think? Uh, I thought it was <laughs> not enough like an actual National Treasure show, even though it had snippets of National Treasure-ness, and actually, shockingly, some compelling some not so compelling connections to the movies the fact that they take the main characters and primarily make them normal 20 somethings with weird cartoon jobs and personalities that aren't related to treasure hunting it's a freeform show which makes it's an abc signature production formerly touchstone studios shout out to last week's pop culture reference Ooh, yeah. um which is of course directly tied to abc family and freeform shows like uh, pretty little liars which i know you're gonna bring up later in this <laughs> discussion uh, yes i am i had no patience for for any of it the only character who i really had any affinity for of the new ones was Oren. I liked Oren, even yeah. though he was annoying and had some <laughs> of the cringiest lines, holding Thor Funko Pops and shoving in c full scenes from Captain Dude, America, the Winter Civil Soldier. War, yeah, uh, ridiculous. But he did reference, of course, like Brian O'Connor from the Fast, the Fast and the Furious. The Furious. Oh, so I got to give him it. one for that. <laughs> um, I got to give him... I, for one, will never forget the Alamo. That's that a great line. That's pretty funny to me, yeah. Like in that Mission Impossible movie. See, he's got the good one-liners, even though he is annoying sometimes. I'm into him. But the rest of this show, I just am not into it, man. It doesn't pull together for me. The treasure hunting is sometimes interesting, but not interesting enough to keep my attention. The cameos are brief and do not tie enough together for me to work I especially thought, kind of light spoilers, 
I thought Riley Poole was going to be in a lot more of the show than he was, and I'm yeah. very bummed about that. Yeah, dude. I I also very much loved Oren. I feel like there were some parts where he, they almost to the camera say like, all right, now, Oren, go away now. Like, we got to do stuff without you. And it, it, as one of the only characters that I thought had anything going on in terms of just like entertaining to watch, I, I was sad when that happened. But I too agree that the cameos were too brief and I felt a little frustrated in my head, like thinking about how something like those cameos could maybe come back through towards the later half of this show. And then and how the, yeah. it would be the smart thing mm. to do and how, oh, this is obviously setting up for the smart writing choice of where this might lead with the established cameos and the people that they have at their disposal. And then they just like sometimes literally just walk through an obstacle with almost nothing to stop them, which which is a frustrating thing for a franchise that should be about overcoming the clues that they come upon through like genuine intellectual work and things that are not easily solved with a computer or a phone it, it's just it's it was very frustrating to me to watch that all and kind of see the hunt of it all get so simply executed that there it really didn't seem like there was much of a hunt going on to begin with I will say I do think that there are a couple of moments where the hunt really picks up and then immediately that momentum is lost by a really lame clue coming through or them stopping the treasure hunting for all of their characters to make out for some reason. Yeah. Cause oh, yeah. there's way more sex and way more killing in this movie than there is, or in this show than there is in either of the movies, which I think is a really weird choice. I do think that in the treasure hunting realm, I think they did a really good job updating the national treasure technological perspective and keeping it feeling modern. It still felt like things like Riley does in national treasure, but incorporating things like cell phones and la and modern laptops and other elements that weren't around back when those first movies were coming out. Yeah, I can understand that. I, I there are this is such a specifically high tech kind of hunt that they're on, especially with their adversary Billy. Played by Catherine Zeta Jones. Who's trying she is trying her best, man. God bless her. She's she's trying. You and know, and she's on Cypher's plane from the Fast Saga. <laughs> she kinda is Cypher. She's got like the the blonde uh haircuts going on. She's very much in control. John Cena's her henchman. That's weird, right? That he he agreed to yeah, do the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the henchman. Now that you bring it up, were an interesting thing that what they did with the at least the two main henchmen that I'm thinking of mm -hmm. was also pretty much entirely unearned because yeah. they they take a half step into that National Treasure One. These henchmen are people with names and motivations for even being henchmen, and then they also just they just throw that into the wind. After they get farther into it. There's well, well, they're evil now. There. They're just evil, and that's all that matters. Yeah. And... yeah, 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 exactly. My goodness gracious. On the point that you were making that this show has so much more, like, on-screen murder and violence and specifically sexually tense romantic situations, but it's also for, like, adult people like me and you and it, who, also it, kind who of is for it teens. For? Because that's this show the, is not that's for my kids. my point. It's not for anyone, it's, it feels like to me. Because it's not for kids. It's not for people that are old enough to actually have grown up. Like... It's not for you and me, I don't think, because the writing is too no. juvenile for that. And that's why it feels so strange and messy when it's like they're bringing up things like, you know, actual cold-blooded murder. And like the writing to me is that of like a Wizards of Waverly Place style drama in between what should but, be the but main where focus they of the like plot. have sex with each other all the time. It's not like explicit. It's not it's not like a Pretty Little Liars or like a Vampire Diaries where they do show yeah, they yeah. do show a bit more of it. Final thoughts before we go into spoilers. If you like the National Treasure movies, watch the Riley episode, which is <laughs> that's episode four. Yes, it is. And you'll be like, man, why did Pop Culture Reference tell me to watch that? <laughs> that sucked. And I'll be like, that's the best part of the show, guys. Oh my god. I would almost even say watch the first three episodes. No, shame. Because I'm because I, okay the uh, are okay. I cannot endorse that and then give my justifications until we get into spoilers. Okay, well... I apologize. Try the first one if you like the first one. Watch the second one. Or you're better off if you don't watch this altogether, <laughs> if I'm being entirely yeah. honest. But if you, yeah. if you like Seamus and me, 
feel an obligation to <laughs> the characters of National Treasure and a love for specifically Riley Poole, it's worth an hour of your time. Yeah, that is, in fact, our very small endorsement. I want to get into the nitty gritty. What is what is the top of your list of things that you're thinking about about this first season here? Well, the finale sucked. The finale... Oh, I, yeah. The Are whole you kidding me? season, I'm waiting for the payoffs. I'm waiting because there's so many interesting ways they could have paid things off in this show. I know we're really just getting into it now. No, let's go, man. The reveal that Dad was alive was, like, kind of interesting, but really confusing, I thought, because they hadn't really... It's too convoluted. They didn't set it up well enough. If they had done a little bit more, it could have been interesting, even though, as it stands now, I think it's really dumb that Hendrix... The background FBI agent (laughs) from the Uh, movies that took place 20 years ago uh, has been secretly evil the whole time. What was he doing in the FBI? What sense does any of it make? They chose me to be Salazar. (laughs) Like, come on. Who cares? Like, who cares? Not me, the viewer who watched this entire season. Not me, the fan of those original movies. I loved running the other FBI agent through with Cortez's sword. That was a fun <sighs> moment. And she's one of the other only characters I actually, I actually liked. Betsy Ross, which I can't believe they <laughs> named her. I am so dumb. I heard her be called Agent Ross, and I heard her called Betsy. And I just, if they explicitly said that her name is that in the show, I, I fully missed it. Because that is just, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. It's not I Benjamin mean, Franklin Gates where the kind of the joke is like, look at these nuts who are naming their kids after yeah, founding fathers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, on the other hand, think they could have cut all of that stuff completely but from it was, this entire season. But it season. was more interesting to me than the main cast, which is why I liked it. Like, I actually found her little romance with the coroner kind of sweet. I think it would have been way cooler if they killed her right then. Oh, yeah. I out loud yelled at my TV, shut up, when the, the <laughs> dude pulled out the orange Tic Tacs and was just, like, tossing them around, like, huh, I don't oh, know. It's what so you dumb. It's, it's so, so dumb. The cut to Sadusky gripping orange Tic Tacs <laughs> with the last piece of strength he has. I thought he was faking his death. The whole season, by the yeah, way. Yeah, me I too. Thought, me too. Oh my god, how stupid is it that they just kill that man off? Give him some honor, guys. Right? Come on. He's just like the demented old grandpa instead of like one of the major players in both of the movies. It's so, it's so sad how they do him. Do you care about Liam, the grandson? I think that the characters have no chemistry. The actors, the, and I don't think the actors are like bad or anything. I think the way they're written leaves them very little room to have chemistry of Mm -hmm. Jess and Liam. Jess is the main character, but I think the setups of their characters are very interesting. The idea of Sandusky's grandson, who is alienated from him because he spent his entire life doing secret societies and FBI stuff and treasure and everything. That's why I think he should have been more of the main character, I feel like. Like, that's Ben Gates stuff right there. (laughs) Jess is interesting to me because she is actually a pretty smart update of how do you do super patriotic franchise national treasure in today's political landscape, you have to reckon with certain political realities. And making her a dreamer, I think, is really interesting. They don't actually know what to do with the setups for those characters, I feel like, once mm. they have them. Half of this series is filler of Liam singing songs every episode. Right. Oh my god, dude. It's it's so ridiculous. I, I'm not, not a fan. I mean, it, he's a good singer, I guess, but like that's not what I'm here to see. It's so much of this show. The only one I liked was when he sang as a distraction at Graceland, and even that was dumb. In most other shows, that would be a dumb low point of a show. <laughs> not this one, but Not this one. I really like Riley trying to do Ben's thing, his talking stream of consciousness, and then being really bad at it. Justin Bartha is doing a good job stepping back into that character, but making him feel like he's grown up a little bit more since the movies. The weird ham-fisted being on the phone with Ben, (laughs) I could have done without, I think. Uh, I really thought they were going to do a Top Gun Maverick at one point where he starts texting him. And it's just going to be the texts from Nick Cage. But for whatever reason, my silly fan brain thought that that was going to maybe lead to Nick Cage being in the finale. But after the Riley episode, I had given up hope on Nick Cage being in the finale. But I really, really, really thought that they would have brought Riley back for the finale to be the plug. Because I thought going into the show, because the way they advertised it was, 
that Riley was like their Charlie, like Charlie's Angels. That's like, what and, I thought was going to go down after they met him at the funeral. And I thought, okay, then they're going to bring him back at the end of the season to do that for them. But they're like, no, I found a tape that has other treasure stuff on it. And it's just vague and anticlimactic. And they could have done a million other things to more excitingly well, tie I mean, in an Easter egg for the next season's treasure, which I'm sure it will get. I like that Sandusky uh, found one of the MacGuffins here at Cibola. I think that's cool. I think that's a good way to tie into the original movies. I don't know. I, is he also... He's talking to Abigail on the phone? No, he's talking to he's talking to Ben on the phone. Abigail's oh, about, out of town. Right, and Ben cause... has to stay home with their dog, Charlotte. Which they, they tease Im- that as a child for a minute there. Yeah. Which I thought was fun. That is kind of fun, but also who... <laughs> cares and they try to do again like the structure of the original films they try to do a I'm gonna steal the declaration of independence oh, scene dude. with I'm gonna break my father out of prison which is I think you know it's lower stakes obviously but the entire show has been lower stakes so far but that's fine but that needed to come way earlier in the season they needed to do something crazy like that way earlier in the season to get or, me to engage I mean, they barely followed through with I'm going to break my dad out of prison which you're like you're saying is already lower stakes but then hey there's just there's a tunnel about half a mile out of the prison that you can walk directly to your father's cell block yeah. <laughs> without any hazards walk in and there's the wrinkle of him sending his daughter into sniper fire at one point which but like what it's the stupidest I, I know his whole little three episodes of an arc is like I have to value my family over this treasure. But, like, that also doesn't really feel like it comes through that much, even when they're finding the treasure in the end. No, I don't care about their relationship. Speaking of finding the treasure, which we haven't even talked about, we haven't even talked about it because it's lame. It's super oh, yeah. lame. There's nothing like interesting. Pots. Not even the treasure itself, because who cares about the treasure itself? It's about the booby traps once you get to the treasure. It's that one mission in Uncharted 4 where you have to follow the footsteps over the or the tiles. Yeah. Like, I just kept thinking it's lame last crusade it's just the lame version of the last crusade that's exactly what it is they teased so many cool different things that they might have movie trap wise they're like decapitating blades da 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 you know all of this different cool stuff that's like there's there's gas that makes one of the guys crazy and they have to end up putting him down there is a cage that falls out of nowhere and then there's like spears that don't go off and, and the and one the henchman guy gets killed in like the fourth or fifth episode by just like falling into a pit, which they're just oh, like oh yeah I forgot about that they're freaking out when he falls into the pit and they're like this whole place is booby trapped get out oh, but it's like who cares man they're it's fairly booby trapped you know how sometimes in like a Vanity Fair or Entertainment Weekly they'll have characters from one show dress up as like. Oh, like, this is a shoot inspired by Grease or inspired by Indiana Jones. Sure, sure. This felt like it was a Teen Vogue shoot for a generic teeny show that was vaguely inspired by National Treasure. It's just all these people that are hot but not interesting sitting around very flatly lit and not doing anything that I am compelled by. Yeah, it it definitely doesn't help in this show that the main antagonist, Billy, this, like, eccentric crypto queen, they keep calling her, that made me roll my eyes a hundred times. The entire concept of her character, dare I call it character, is, like, unlimited money and unlimited guys who will do whatever she says and also a plane that can go anywhere always at any time and can also fly across the country in like an hour flat no matter where they are and yeah nothing really matters in her stakes at all she's like oh my brother and it's just like whatever man it's fine she is somehow even less compelling than ed harris's character from book of secrets who is not very compelling was missing ed harris (laughs) watching this show dude i was missing our boy ed harris why isn't Ian, the villain in this show. Like, why? Like, Sean Bean, yeah. he's around. You could have gotten he could him. Throw him in. Throw him in. Billy is alive and arrested at the end of this, right? She gets captured. Oh, but, you know, that's the thing. She's too OP. There's no stakes. There's no risk because you know she's just going to be able to come back out again. She'll just snap her fingers and she'll be out of prison because she's Salazar now. Don't forget. Oh, yeah. She killed Hendrix. Stupid. So dumb. The post credit scenes, them, like, Instagramming about their sneaker deal with the president or whatever. (laughs) 
I everyone's a lawyer and also everyone has citizenship now and also everyone is a famous singer and which also the happy endings completely undermine everything that thematically they even tried a little bit to do with the like old person's idea of what woke zoomers would talk about <laughs> uh, i woke up early this morning to watch the finale garrett i want you to know that oh, I woke this is up so fresh so... for you Shavis, i'm so sucks. sorry dude every little thing about this i mean except for my like full-blown freak out when riley says you have 47 reasons to be interested and even that in retrospect felt so unfair to me and you specifically <laughs> like it's the stupidest thing for nobody to be excited about but us and we're like hey maybe they care about these movies and they're going to do something about it in this show and we're just left hanging for six more 45 minute episodes they could have just shaved this down and made them 21 minute episodes and it would have been or six so much more bearable. episodes or six yeah. episodes yeah even the Graceland, what did you feel about the Graceland stuff in general? I feel like it was as fun of an idea as heisting Graceland some Graceland it, stuff is. It just felt so uninteresting. It was the best it. executed heist in the show, but that being said, it was nothing. It was very boring. All of the people were cartoonishly incompetent. You could just walk in there and take it anyway, it feels like. Nobody feels <laughs> serious. One moth, and they go, hey, take this guy we've never seen to the uh, secret room. And where they, they, it's like, what? They're like, we usually blindfold people, but <laughs> I guess I won't for some reason with you. Oh, so dumb. The dumbest disguises. It's like bad Scooby-Doo. <laughs> it's like we're getting two versions of bad Scooby-Doo in one year, and it's uh, it's upsetting. Something that I thought was interesting and kind of excited me was a couple of the episodes it was previously on, and then it was just clips from the movie, and that kind of felt cool. I was like, previously on the movies, right? We're watching, like, the National Treasure Saga. Like Riley's episode where they yeah. show the woman at the end of Book of Secrets, and I, I, for a hot minute, I was like, is this woman gonna be in this show? Like, are they bringing her back? That's exactly where I was going, Seamus. When they showed her, I really did think, oh, wow, it's going to be Riley and his new wife, his super model wife that he met at Mount Rushmore and <laughs> is a Riley Pool super fan. I was hoping it was going to be like a mirrored version of what happened with Ben and Abigail where it's like they're having problems and he's having like his own Riley version of his Ben Gates like getting kicked out of their house problem. Honestly I, that's I way more in character for Riley than for Ben I feel like. Yeah you think so? I mean weirdly enough that woman seems to only be interested in him because he is the Riley Pool. I mean, maybe they yeah, don't but have then maybe, anything in common. But that's the thing, right? We were just talking about how Riley's character is, especially once he gets rich at the end of the first movie, is he's trying to be so cool and suave and confident in something that he's not. The comedy comes from, oh, I'm cool and I've got a Ferrari and I'm using it to pick up chicks, but it's actually getting impounded. And <laughs> I feel like that would be perfect of you're Riley Poole I'm such a big fan of your work and then he can't live up it's like the Fablements he can't live up to being <laughs> Riley Poole I was gonna say it's like the opposite of Patrick Gates it's like this woman left me because I was obsessed with the treasure but it's like what if this woman leaves him because he's not actively treasure hunting as much anymore and she's like disinterested and the less adventury version of a person he's sitting at home like Benji in Mission Impossible 5 playing Halo and <laughs> she's just like where is where is the treasure hunting? I guess he would be playing Uncharted, probably. But oh god, I w I would hope so. It's like he's like trying to write a second book, but he can't quite break the what is the book of secrets of my new book, babe? And she's just like, go find another treasure, man. You gotta you, you know, gotta get I, out there. I knew I shouldn't have blown all of the different secrets and conspiracies <laughs> other than Templar treasure on the first book, but I thought, you know, my publisher <laughs> said it would sell well, but now here I am. That is very perfect. That is very good. We need the Riley-only spinoff show. Again, the Edge of Riley. I really thought that's what this was going to be. I know, I know we've just too. said that. It's such a bummer that they couldn't even bring that back at the end. I've been trying to reconcile with the lack of Riley Poole and Ben Gates. And, you know, all I wanted a lot more of the movie stuff, of course. But I've been reconciling with it, thinking now that they didn't like have the like the Ben Gates in the finale, or this wasn't way more connected with Riley. Now, when National Treasure Three does uh, eventually come out, maybe Jess and Liam 
and all of these stupid characters won't be in it. For a while watching the season, I was like, okay, they're going to set up for the third movie. And then after a while, I was like, oh no, what if the third movie is way more of these new characters than Ben Gates and Riley Poole and Abigail and all, all the people? But now it seems like they can just be their own little bubble of meaninglessness. And then if we get... National Treasure 3, it doesn't necessarily have to involve them so much working no. with the, the main crew. I was trying to look real hard. There was a couple shots of Billy's, like, computer stuff, like, oh, look at all these names that she's tracking. I was looking real hard for a Ben Gates or, or something in there. I didn't catch anything, but I, I thought that could have been even a, the slightest bit more connected. Maybe this weird secret society with Salazar has butted heads with the Gateses in the past. Who well, knows? Maybe that'd be something. The the showrunner did an interview that I read that originally they had a line in the script when Catherine Cedar Jones is talking to the board of mysterious <laughs> faceless men. There was supposed to be a line in there where they said something about like, we don't want another Templar treasure on our hands. And then she would be like, that was Ian Howe's fault, not mine. And Implying I am so that... colossally glad that that was not in there because... It Dude, would make no too. <laughs> sense for him Dude. to be a part of that treasure-destroying society. Yeah, oh my god, that would have been so unbelievably lame. I, I was, like, a little excited, like, oh, what little behind-the-scenes thing could they have gone with? But that would have been such a lame angle to take. I'm glad they didn't do that. Fun Ethan ones, maybe. is useless, and I do not want him on the show ever again. Don't you want to see him dance to Lady Gaga again? <gasps> Come on, bro. Uh, that entire episode, Shane, I'm like... <laughs> What do you mean you have to do the dance? Guys, oh my God. you're here. sneaking into the governor's ball and you're like, oh, oh, I guess they're playing the most played Lady Gaga song of all time. I guess we have to blow our cover super hard. You know, I did the Macarena in the fourth grade talent show. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I'm going to blow my cover because oh, I have to do God, it. Oh my so stupid. E Ethan and everything that he does in this show is boring. I don't care. Even the will they, won't they, it was like they're trying to set up a love triangle. That was a not. It was, a, it was not. His whole weird thing with the other girl that he's dating and who cares? There's too many characters who in the cares, show already. Dude, Why? About the nurse doctor lady. I, oh my God. It is a shame because I think if they had just like one less friend in the group, one less friend in the group and then you meet Liam and he is that addition to your group mm -hmm. and then maybe that's your team it's the perfect trio of girl girl boy that so many franchises are built on jess orin and tasha you could just have the three of them and then bring liam into the group to balance the genders not that you need to do that but like you know that's a tried and true but, writing and, and she can still be like oh i have such a hard time with boys to her yeah, friends and they're there's... like well we're in a couple kind yeah. of and we are we understand you and then uh, whatever the one thing that i like out of all of the stupid love triangle stuff their banter in the last episode about boy scouts was funny sure sure if they it wasn't worth <sighs> having wasn't everything worth the else whole season but, yeah no way like it's too little way too late i'm not looking forward to having to watch the next season of this show eventually i fully expect that they're gonna probably do another season of this show before the third movie comes out which will be even sadder of a reality oh before i forget i want to give a special shout out to the uh long-haired old man in this show that followed them for like five episodes and then is immediately killed <laughs> after he gets out of his car which <laughs> who I, cares I just, what is happening he didn't need to be in because he wasn't it's even so interesting funny. i just it's so funny to me how much emphasis they put on him where they're like chasing him away from the funeral and like he's in the graceland episode and it just doesn't amount to a single thing i will say i do actually the scene after he is killed where billy has her dad hostage and she's like you gotta come out or i'm gonna kill your dad i actually thought that was pretty good i thought that was a pretty good scene i mean i guess i'm trying to think of any other it's, it's not like it was a great scene or anything better than was, a lot of other scenes it was a moment show. that i was actually kind of a little bit compelled that's fair that's fair like you were just saying a moment ago there's too many characters in a show 
like this, if they shrunk down the scope of characters a little bit more to focus on maybe the dad a little bit more or something, I feel like that would have gotten me a little better. But I don't know. It was a boring villain taking a character hostage that we had met like the episode before <laughs> in their lame prison break. I don't know, man. Like I said... Ugh. I would have really liked it if there were two, which they kind of did for a couple episodes, but not enough of them. If there was another clue that Jess and her dad got separated from the rest of the gang and they had to go find after the prison break. They didn't like each other at all, and they really came together over it, because they have to work together, because they're, you know, he wants Mm. to be her dad, and she doesn't want anything to do with him other than to find treasure. And then you have the B-team going and, like, doing some other stuff, keeping Billy busy or whatever. And then you come together in an actually satisfying finale. The two storylines come together when they both find the treasure separately, and Jess Mm, gets mm. gets to the door, and she's missing the pipe. And she goes, could it really be that simple? But I don't have the pipe. And then Orin walks in from behind her. He's like, but I have the pipe. <laughs> and, you know, it's not actually literally the pipe. But sure, you get no, the, yeah, the, the, what the pipe is in you, this story. You get yeah. the idea of, totally, like, totally. and then the two storylines come together and it's satisfying. And then the clunk, clunk, and then the treasure door opens. And then it doesn't matter if it's the lame treasure that's at the end. What's satisfying is the coming together of the storylines and the characters, which we do not get. No, we absolutely do not. We get... Constantly splitting up the characters that are actually sometimes fun together and then leading you down a boring path of, like, two coyote traps and then nothing else, really. They don't even do an actual sword fight with the Cortez sword, which I think is a big loss. Like I mentioned, FBI agent Betsy Ross, I loved destroying, like, just absolutely impaling her, but I think we needed a real sword fight. Maybe Ethan... Had a fencing badge from Boy Scouts or something. I, I like don't know. Is that. That, stupid? that could be cool. Has to keep Billy busy while they solve a puzzle or whatever. Yeah, yeah. S- sword fighting on the trap floor where the arrows are like turning because they're. Fe- I don't know. Are we getting too into the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull here? Maybe a little bit. No, but... I don't think so. I think no? we're. No. I'm gonna say it. If this show were more like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, it would be a it better show. It would be show. better. Yeah, absolutely. Freaking lootly, are you kidding me? It's too long when to shrink the episodes now. 45 minute episodes of BS is not how you make a good show. Especially because I guess this is an advantage of having a lot of characters. There were cool parts where two national treasure things would be happening simultaneously. So, like in the front seat, Tasha hacking, and then mm-hmm. in the back seat, you have Liam ciphering. And they're working on two different things. And I thought that was actually really fun having that back and forth going. And it was cool to have, because National Treasure movies don't really do that. They don't really have two National Treasure things happening at once very often. While that was compelling, I remember thinking during a couple of those sequences, I was like, you know, guys, you could split these into two sequences and not had to have <laughs> uh, Liam sing this episode. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't have to have a tense showdown that leads to nothing three times in three episodes. You Looking know? at you, WandaVision, got him. Oh, um, oh, oh, man. Are all Disney Plus shows having the same problem? Weird. No, it couldn't be, couldn't be. I know we already, like, really stated that we don't recommend this show. <laughs> but boy, it's just... It's very frustrating, and Seamus, I frankly like it less after our conversation. Yeah, honestly, I think it's a fun, like, hate watch. I feel like maybe if we watch season two together, we can just groan about it together, and that'll be more fun than just slogging through it, because it is bad. Again, if somehow this show connects farther into these movies as it goes on, I that is what we have to do. Like you said, it's our pact that we will consume any National Treasure content that comes out because we are brand loyal to the National Treasure (laughs) franchise. Because also, I hate to say it, watching this show makes it more likely they'll make National Treasure 3. It just does. And, you know, if that if we get our chance at that, if page 47, like they teased, is in fact coming and it's not just going to be like they're going to dumb it down to a lame storyline for a season of this show, which would be the most tragic thing to ever befall national treasure that would be the biggest franchise disappointment maybe i've ever had because page 47 yeah, dude, is oh. mythic it has been built up for 15 years it's like and... what's in the briefcase in pulp fiction and what's on page 47 in national treasure book of secrets but, that it's that big it would be like if you wondered for 30 years if boba fett got out of the sarlacc pit. <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah, it really would be. It it, it would be if the, it, it would be Book of Boba Fetting, the Book of Secrets, the secret book of Boba Fett, and it would be terrible. 
to use my man Riley Poole to suck me in and make me excited for your show and then just absolutely crushing me for the rest of the season that is that's a cruelty I think on their part and I I hope they shape up for for the next season have I tried to hit it harder that this show makes me really really appreciate Book of Secrets I want to be clear on that that Book of Secrets is now way higher on my my national treasure list because it shows you, even though things can be disappointing and feel weird and have not super compelling villains or the writing can fall flat sometimes, it can still really feel like National Treasure all yeah. the time. This hardly ever feels like National Treasure, and for the brief moments it does, it then makes it all the more disappointing when it comes crashing back down to Earth. Because it never ends an episode on a high note. In the future, whatever seasons I force myself to watch, it will be a one-and-done viewing just to just to be up on the continuity of whatever reference they'll put in whatever future movies speaking of references Shambus, Ooh. should we move on to our pop culture reference of the episode let's do it for today's pop culture reference we're going to be talking about retcons retcon or retroactive continuity is the narrative convention of changing important details of a story to expand on elements or characters that were otherwise already established. The term was coined in 1973 by author E. Frank Tupper, but gained more widespread usage when comic book subcultures started to use it to identify the many rewritten plot elements in long-running comic series. Another famous early retcon that many point to as an example is the death of Sherlock Holmes in The Final Problem by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which he later retconned as a staged death after public backlash and a call for further stories about the character. The pop culture reference podcast favorite The Fast Saga is known for its major retcons throughout the franchise, including going back on major character deaths and changing key story moments to fit in with new plot hooks that drive newly written scripts. The introduction of Jason Momoa in the Fast X trailer is a direct retcon of the climax of Fast Five, showing this newly introduced character in the place of an otherwise unnamed henchman in the original timeline of events. Podcast favorite Han's death was also famously retconned to reintroduce him in F9. This detail also retcons the crucial plot hook of Fast 7, where Shaw was very specifically the culprit behind Han's death, which was in itself a retcon from Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. I know uh, some retcon, some major retcons and things like, you know, Star Wars and or I know there was a lot of people picking out the character retcons of his home planet. His age was changed for the new show that kind of let the writers give him a little more time to spend before the events of Rogue One. I think technically also a lot of the events in Rogue One were retcons to the original Star Wars, A New Hope, with, like, the entire inclusion of the weakness on the Death Star itself was a, was a retcon that they wrote in for these characters to be looking for. Um, we talked last week about, a f like, the retcons that National Treasure in, in the Book of Secrets, they retcon the very heavily implied death of Ben Gates' mother into them just having, like, a weird, bitter divorce who to I deal with instead. I don't know if we brought up in the main segment, but she got a shout out in the show. Oh, actually, yes, she did. That, that was because it's another uh, Central American treasure and she's an expert. Retcons are something that a lot of people get really upset about. We're in the modern era of everybody worshipping canon. Canon is like mm, mm. the most important term in pop culture right now. And who cares? Genuinely, yeah, who cares? I, Honestly, the amount of retcons, I mean, we didn't even scratch the surface for Fast and the Furious retcons, really, but, like, that amount of them and how freely they, they use retcons to further the franchise, it's almost like a freeing kind of feeling, like, nothing really matters, like, they can go back and do whatever, they've got the weird technology of their world, and they've got as many shadow organizations as they need to, to pull off some dumb stuff. I mean, maybe it's not all gonna land, but at least it gives just, like, ultimate... Nothing has to feel canon anymore, you know? Like, everything is its own extra add-on to the world. And obviously, some retcons, like all writing, can be bad and executed poorly and not make sense, but as long as you're making sure that you're coming from a place that's story motivated, that's character motivated, that the changes you're making are not just alienating the audience, but mm. in fact enriching the story you're currently telling. I think that's what's important. But should we move on to Save the Rec Center? 
Let's save it, Garrett. Save the Red Center! Now it's time to save the Rec Center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. Garrett, what do you got this week? Well, if you haven't heard it from everybody else in your life that's watched it, or online, or Entertainment Weekly, or wherever you consume entertainment information that is not pop culture reference, you should, on Apple TV, be watching the series Severance. I finally got Ah. to this a couple weeks ago, watched it very, very quickly. It's only a few episodes. The first season is completely out. The second season, I think, is filming right now. And it's some of the best science fiction I've ever seen on television. It has a wonderful cast, including Adam Scott, John Turturro, and Christopher Walken, and Patricia Arquette. Plus, a lot of really great actors whose names you might not know, but are transcendent in their roles on on the series. I didn't really know anything going in. I knew it was like a workplace sci-fi show, and that's really all. I didn't even know what the title was referring to. And I think that's kind of the best way to go into it, is knowing as little as possible and just letting the show take you on the journey that it is engineered to take you on. On the recommendation of my mother, actually, I I watched the first episode not too long ago, and I loved it. I thought it was absolutely fabulous. You know I am a freak for creepy liminal things that look very beautiful liminal. and unsettling, and it is incredible. And I, I really want to get back to it. I, I only watched that first episode, but it, it enchanted me, and everyone in there is... Pretty much people that I love anyway, so I I think I will try to get... I'm going to get this first season done before season two comes out, because I will, I'm sure, love it as much as you do. If, if I loved this first episode, am I just going to just fall deeper in the rabbit hole for the for the whole season? Is that is that your endorsement? Absolutely, and once you get past probably the second episode, you're just going to take a gravitational tumble and want to finish them all <laughs> as quick of succession as you can. Oh, awesome. Okay. I am I am in for that. But Seamus, what do you have for your rec center this week? I have always been pretty curious about this little piece here, but I just bought the Blade Runner Enhanced Edition video game, the remaster of the 1997 point-and-click detective Blade Runner computer game. And it is the weirdest. I mean, I knew I was going to get into some weird stuff. It's like a weird prequel. You play as just this other Blade Runner McCoy. You you don't, you know, you're just running around trying to solve a, a replicant mystery throughout LA. It, I think it's like takes place right before the events of the original movie. And really, I bought it to listen to the Blade Runner soundtrack while there's, like, weird 90s CGI going on in the background, and that's exactly what I really got out of this game. It's it's an interesting little play. I, I'm about halfway through it right now, and it it is definitely interesting for a Blade Runner fan, but really it is just, like, the ambiance game of that weird, creepy 90s CG It's like one of the first um, motion capture CGI projects from when that was like an er an early stages of that in development. And I I think it's just truly fascinating if you I think, Garrett, you you've got a a little history of playing like old PC computer games. Any any point and click stuff in your past? Would, Would you try this out? Totally. I like point and click stuff a lot. And my dumb little brain is just going to Veggie Tales right now. The Veggie <laughs> oh Tales yeah, point hell and click yeah! Game. But uh, if they can get this on on a contemporary console, where is Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis? That's what <laughs> dude, I would like to know. That's what I'm saying. I've always wanted to play that too, and it 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 scratches that weird itch of like it, it's so rudimentary. It doesn't overwhelm you with much choice and options it's from 1997 you're you're just going in for the ambiance and the little story to watch the a 4k render of a 
truly insane looking 90s CGI flying police car cruise around your screen. It's it's very interesting to say the least. It was like four bucks on sale right now, actually. It, it is uh, well worth it just for the curiosity of it all. And it's got a short little trophy list, so I might I might run well, through it a, a couple I'm, times. I'm shocked to learn that, Seamus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll maybe have to bite the bullet on that because or I'll just you could just play it at my place, man. It's worth true. it just to to do it around a little bit. It, it's it's very interesting. I did just recently rewatch Blade Runner, and so I'm kind of in did that too. mood. That's what I I borrowed it from you, and then immediately played this game. It, it is a it is a groovy little flashback to 1997. It, it's it's really interesting. But that wraps us up for the show this week. If you want to find us on social media, that's at PCR underscore podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can reach the show directly by emailing popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. Garrett, what are we doing next week for the show? Well, currently we are scheduled, and you and I can discuss whether or not we want to keep (laughs) this. The first two Ant-Men. I see. Movies that I actually very much enjoy. Yeah. So I think I think it'd be worth it. Yeah, I think I think let's lock that in. I love Paul. I'm a Paul Rudd stan. I will always support Paul Rudd. I think these are unsung heroes of the MCU. It'll be an interesting. It'll be an interesting little checkup on these ones. I don't think I've seen either of these since they were in the theater. So it'll be an oh, interesting. Oh wow, for real? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've forgotten a lot. I think they're they're very interesting. I definitely saw the first Ant Man more than once, but I might have just seen it twice in the theater. If I'm being honest, well, I think we're probably going to be talking a lot more about Ant Man two than Ant Man one. Probably, you know, you know what I mean. Oh well, maybe I don't know. I, I guess I really don't remember a lot about <laughs> Ant Man two. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. Uh... Well, we'll get it. We'll get into it next week, my friend. Oh, I'm looking forward to it, Seamus. Adios, amigos.